Candace Cochran, age 28. She's been missing since August the 20th, 2019 from Sutton, West Virginia. She was born April the 27th, 1991. She would be 31 years old. Um, she was 5 foot 2 and weighed around 105 to 115 pounds. Caucasian female with brown hair and blue eyes. She often dyes her hair different colors, and in many of the pictures of her, her hair was blonde. She has a tattoo on her right thigh of three skulls. Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. The investigating agency is the West Virginia State Police. Cochran was last seen in Sutton, West Virginia on August the 20th, 2019. Her mother went to work that day, and when she returned, her daughter was gone, and all of her belongings were left behind as though she had just gone out and planned to come home. She left a handwritten note saying, Mom, I took off for a little while. I'm in good hands, I promise. Be back shortly. Cochran was living with her mother at the time of her disappearance. According to police, her mother went to work on August 20, 2019, and Cochran was nowhere to be found when she returned home. All of her belongings were still there. West Virginia State Police Post says, 8-20-2019, she had brown hair and blue eyes, 5 foot 3, 110 pounds. She was living with her mother, and it just goes on to tell the same details. If anyone has any information, please contact West Virginia State Police at 304-765-2101. Mother is desperate to find her missing daughter after a year-long search. Becky Cochran says she hasn't slept through the night for three years. How do you get up and go in there and go to bed when your child is missing? Around her, life has gone on, but hers stopped on August 20, 2019, the last time she saw her daughter, Chandice, age 28. I just feel like this is hell on earth. That's how I feel. I'm living in hell. This is it, she said. You know, I spoke about that earlier, how... How hard it must be for people, parents especially, to go to bed at night not knowing the state of their child, even if their child is, uh, if they know where their child is and they know their child's alive and they're still living some type of dangerous lifestyle or involved in something that they have no control over, it, it still has to be difficult. Um, and... That's one reason why I tell these stories, because somebody out there is feeling this way, and, and these are somebody's children, just like this mother. She lays awake at night not knowing. Chandice had a picture-perfect childhood growing up in Braxton County. She was athletic and popular and had a large group of friends. She had an unbreakable bond with her older brother, Bert, Life was a fairy tale for them, she said. Addiction doesn't care about a fairy tale. Bert was found dead on Father's Day in 2010. He was 21 years old. He always took care of her and protected her. When we lost him, she said, I can't imagine my life without him. I can't do this. Bert's death was the beginning of a troubled path for Chandice. She was prescribed pain pills following an emergency surgery, which eventually led to a heroin addiction. People have no idea unless they have lived through this, said her mother, Becky. I can't even bring myself to buy a local newspaper anymore. Um, a lot of their friends are gone. They're gone or they are incarcerated. I won't even buy a county paper around here because of all the drugs. And you see all the children that you watched grow up are now involved in that. Two weeks before 
her disappearance, Becky saw a change which she had been praying for. Chandice was fighting hard to stay clean and turn her life around after nearly ten years of addiction. I could see that she had gotten her will to live back, and she was doing great. Becky came home and found a note. It still sits on her kitchen counter. It says, Mom, I took off for a while. I'm in good hands, I promise. I'll be back shortly. Please don't worry. If you need me, call me if you need to. Love, Chan. What happens next has Becky on her own path to find her daughter. A man named Christopher Spees, well, maybe it's Christopher Spears, but it's Christopher Spees, who was from Gilmer County, picked Chandice up that afternoon from her mother's home in Sutton. They went to the Birch River area of Nicholas County. Troopers said they believed they were selling drugs. Cooper said Chandice knew people in the area, but Spees didn't have a lot of connections there. He did have outstanding warrants for failing to register as a sex offender. The two ended up at the home of a man named Sam Kelly. That is where the truth about what happens next falls apart. That was around midnight. They were there for a while. They decided it was time to leave. Senior Trooper Caleb Harper said, the gentleman, Kelly, went to the Go Mart to get some cigarettes with his girlfriend. When they came back, they actually they actually see Mr. Spees and Chandis leaving on foot, heading towards the fire department, and that was the last time that they saw them. Um, since then, there has been no proof that Chandis is alive and no proof that she's not. Around 7 a.m. the next day, Spees was picked up walking along the road a few miles from Birch River. It was Kelly who picked him up. Kelly told investigators he had happened to spot Spees as he was on his way to work and offered to give him a ride. There was no sign of Chandice. According to Mr. Spees and what evidence I have been able to gather from her cell phone records, it does appear that her cell phone died sometime around midnight or sometime after that, and it was never turned back on. Since then, Spees has been arrested on charges unrelated to Chandice's disappearance that have landed him at the Huttonsville Correctional Center. He is serving time on convictions out of Braxton, Lewis, and Nicholas counties for grand larceny, attempt to commit grand larceny, and failure to register as a sex offender. Eyewitness News reporter Leslie Rubin wrote a letter to him in July as the three-year anniversary of Chandice's disappearance was approaching, asking if he had any information that could help bring closer. Spees wrote back in a one-page letter, I would love for Chandice to be found so it would clear my name. I've sat down with investigators countless times going over the events of that night. Chandice and I was partying. We had been up for a few days on meth and Sanex. So my memory was like one of those picture books that you flip through really fast. I didn't do anything to her, and I don't know where she's at. Bees has been interviewed several times by West Virginia State Troopers investigating the case. Bees Becky was there for one of the interviews, and she said that it still haunts her. He went through everything just the same way that he told the state. When he got up to leave the room, I hollered at him, and I said, Just tell me, is she alive? Is she with us or not? And he said, Not. That's all he said, and just walked out of the room. Harper said Spees has cooperated with him, and they have done interviews, and he is unsure if he's being deceitful or not about what he knows. It's a really hard question to answer whether he's being deceitful or he's trying to hide something. But it's my opinion in talking to him that he does appear to be genuine in trying to help. The trooper said he went back to re-interview him and it may have been his idea to go over there to try and jog his memory. We spent several days together 
either talking or me driving him around the area to look for things that might help his memory. In the days and weeks following Chandice's disappearance, extensive searches were conducted and into the area that Spee was picked up walking along the road. Nothing has been found. He can tell you where he was at and what he was doing up until around 2 o'clock in the morning, and he says he cannot remember anything between then and being picked up walking along the road the next morning. The time is between, in between is something he tells us he can't recall. Well, it may be that a drug-induced coma or a blackout may have occurred. It also could be that the two of them may have fallen walking around in the woods and in a dark area. It could be that someone else came along and picked this girl up while he was out of his head. Or it could be that during some type of rage or our argument that he did something to her and he's either really, really good at lying and covering for himself it doesn't say anything here about a lie detector tits, which I personally don't um, believe is really worth what it's, you know, I don't really believe in them. I, I just don't. Some people might say, you know, it, it's like this. Someone takes one and they fail it, and you say, no, they couldn't have failed it. They couldn't have failed this lie detector test. Their, their police must be, you know, um, altering it in some way and then in other cases they take one and pass it and you're like no there's no way they passed it you know so I personally just don't believe in them but whatever happened between those hours of 2 and 7 a.m. he claims not to remember and he may not maybe it was such a violent incident that he did block it out you know but more than likely, he's just choosing to not remember. But like they said, they searched the area and they found nothing. Um, people on foot in an area that they're not real familiar with, I don't know how far could they get. If he wasn't that far, if he was close enough to the man's house, that picked him up walking. And this was the home that he had been at the night before. And they picked him up walking as they're on their way to work. They, he couldn't have been very far from their home. And so if the police went back to that same area and searched for this girl. And what's the story about that man and his wife? They left to go get cigarettes and leave these these people in their home and they come back and these people are leaving on foot. Around 7 a.m. the following day, Spees was picked up walking along Widen Deal Road a few miles from Birch River. It was Sam Kelly who picked him up. He said he was on his way to work and he saw Spees walking and picked him up and gave him a ride. There was no sign of Chandice. So did this Sam Kelly guy say to him, Hey, where's this girl I was with last night? It's 7 o'clock in the morning. You guys left my house at midnight last night walking away. Where, what happened to her? According to Mr. Spees, and from my evidence I've been able to gather from her cell phone records, it appears that her phone died sometime around midnight and was never turned back on again. But since this took place, Spees has been arrested on charges unrelated to Chandice's disappearance. And he um, was in the Huttonsville Correction Center. He is serving time on convictions out of Braxton, Lewis, and Nicholas County for grand larceny, attempt to commit grand larceny, and failure to register as a sex offender. Now, my big red flag here out of all of this is this Sam Kelly guy was he questioned a little more by the police was he asked 
what were they doing at your house that night? It's just very odd that of all the people in the whole entire community, that Sam Kelly, whose home they were at, was the one that picked this guy up the next morning and gave him a ride. And one of the reasons why these cases like hers intrigues me more than the big name cases is because they don't get as much coverage. And because the normal person, law enforcement, people who investigate these types of cases and people who hear about them, automatically, almost, almost automatically say, oh, well, it was drug-related, and they move on. And it's a good possibility. It's a very good possibility that whatever happened to this woman did involve drugs. But that shouldn't matter. Um, it is well known that someone living a more riskier and more dangerous lifestyle are more it's less of a of a shock when something like this happens to them than it is for someone like um, a homemaker. Like I mentioned Lacey Peterson in another video that I did, and I don't want to just like use her as an, an example, but I will because someone like her who was from a um, nice community had a good background education. Uh, was pregnant, getting ready to give birth, and that was probably the big part of the story that really, you know, caught the nation's attention about her. A cheating husband, and so on. And those cases get so much attention. And these cases, like this young woman, don't get that much attention. In small towns, people talk, and you would think that there would have been a little bit more, but I'm sure there were plenty of rumors floating around. I'm sure there was plenty of fingers being pointed. But I think what it boiled down to was everybody believed that Christopher Spees was responsible for whatever may have happened uh, because he was the last person known to be with her. And... Um, as of the updates about him, the last thing I could find about him was that he was arrested and he was charged with two separate counts of failure to make changes or report changes to his status as a registered sex offender. So he was charged and he was um, incarcerated for those charges. He, I did find one article, I will try to find it in and uh, post it where he was um, charged with um, possession of a handgun by a convicted felon and a couple of other charges unrelated. As of today, he's never been charged with anything related to um, this girl's disappearance. And um, that's basically really where this case stands now. She's still considered a missing person. I don't know that her case is considered a code case or if it's still active. Um, there is a phone number and I will post it in the um, video. If anyone has any information about this case or may know the whereabouts of Chandice Cochran, please contact the West Virginia State Police.